Thank you, wonderful friends, for being here tonight. Uh, I consider it a great honor to be part of Dr. Kennedy's conference. I have admired him and been his friend since we were together on the public platform in the exciting year of 1980. And it is great that you are carrying on his work. Thank you for being here. Tonight we're going to talk about a little bit of history. Doing the impossible, defeating the Equal Rights Amendment. It's been about 25 years since we celebrated the final burial of the Equal Rights Amendment, known as ERA, a proposed amendment to the U.S. Constitution that was advertised as a great benefit to women, something that would rescue women from second-class citizenship and, for the first time, put women into the Constitution. ERA was passionately debated across America from 1972 to 1982. And then ERA was rejected by the American people. And the big lesson we learned from this is that in the marvelous process of self-government given to us by our founding fathers, it is possible for the people to defeat the entire political and media establishment and to win despite incredible odds. <laughs> ERA passed Congress with only 23 out of 435 members of the House voting no and passed the Senate with only eight out of 100 senators voting no. And then it was sent out to the states on March 22nd, 1972. Within the first 12 months, it was ratified in 30 states. And under our Constitution, they only needed eight more. ERA has such a righteous name. Who could possibly oppose equal rights? And supporting ERA were all those who had pretensions to political power, from left to right, from Ted Kennedy to George Wallace, and three presidents of the United States, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, and Jimmy Carter. President Nixon said today that he favors passage of the Equal Rights Amendment for Women. The Equal Rights Amendment, which I wholeheartedly endorse, has not yet been ratified by the number of states necessary to make it a part of our Constitution. We will not fail. We did not get in this fight to lose, and we do not intend to lose. We will ratify the Equal Rights Amendment for the United States of America. ERA was actively supported by most of the pushy women's organizations, a, a consortium of 33 women's magazines, numerous Hollywood celebrities, and 99% of the media. But a little band of unflappable Stop ERA ladies in red, headquartered in my kitchen on the bluffs of the Mississippi River in Alton, Illinois, set out to challenge all the big guns of modern politics. We had no big names on our side. No presidents, no governors. The governors of North Carolina and Florida publicly demonstrated against us. There was only one lone senator out of 100 who was willing to speak out against ERA, Watergate Senator Sam Irvin. And only three House members out of 435 dared to say a good word for our cause, Henry Hyde, George Hansen, and Bob Dornan. None of the conservative magazines, journalists, and columnists we read today wrote helpful articles. We didn't have any friendly TV and radio talk show hosts. Everyone was hostile. There was no Rush Limbaugh talking about the feminazis. There was, <laughs> there was, there was no Fox News to give balanced news and let the audience decide. There wasn't any no-spin zone. From the get-go, we had to fight the semantics and the momentum. Now, ERA does not mention women. ERA called for equality of rights on account of sex. Yet all the reporters consistently called ERA the Equal Rights for Women Amendment, 
something to give women equal rights. The House today, by the overwhelming vote of 354 to 23, passed a proposed constitutional amendment to guarantee equal rights for women. In other news, in a historic decision, the Senate voted 84 to 8 today to approve a constitutional amendment guaranteeing equal rights to women. The proposal goes to the states for ratification. Well, as Walter Cronkite would have said, that's the way it was. Well, it, to get around big media, uh, we didn't have any internet, we didn't have fax machines, we only had the telephone and the Phyllis Schlafly report. And our campaign was started with the February 1972 Phyllis Schlafly report called, What's Wrong with Equal Rights for Women? Over the 10 years, I wrote about 100 issues of my newsletter about ERA, and those reports staked out the battleground on which we engaged our adversaries, namely the legal rights that women would lose if ERA were ever ratified. And that strategic decision forced the feminists to spend their time attacking me and trying to answer the arguments in my newsletters. We showed that ERA was a fraud while pretending to benefit women, it actually would be a big takeaway of rights that women then possessed, such as the right of an 18-year-old girl not to be drafted and sent into military combat, and the right of a wife to be supported by her husband. We got our facts straight from the writings of the pro-ERA legal authorities. Yale professor Thomas I. Emerson's article in the Yale Law Journal and ACLU lawyer Ruth Bader Ginsburg's federally financed book called Sex Bias in the U.S. Code. These documents confirmed our arguments that ERA would draft women into military combat and abolish the presumption that the husband should support his wife and also take away the social security benefits of wives and widows. The ERAers could not show any benefit to women, not even in employment, since employment laws were already sex neutral. The ERAers said their amendment would put women into the Constitution, but we showed that the Constitution doesn't mention men or women. It uses only sex neutral words, such as we the people, person, citizen, senator, and president. Now, another document we used was Revolution Tomorrow is Now. This was a publication of the National Organization for Women that set forth NOW's radical pro-abortion and anti-Christian agenda. We reprinted NOW's booklet, and we sold it to raise funds for Stop ERA. <laughs> We told people to be sure and read both sides of the story. Well, we showed that ERA would give enormous power to the federal courts to define the words sex and equality of rights. And Section 2 of ERA would give vast new powers to the federal government over all the laws that make any differences of treatment between men and women on account of sex, marriage, property, divorce, alimony, adoptions, abortion, homosexual laws, sex crimes, private and public schools, boy and girl scouts, prison regulations, and insurance. Now, in September 1972, I invited 100 subscribers to the Phyllis Schlafly Report to meet me in St. Louis. We adopted the name Stop ERA, and we selected our insignia, the stop sign. And then we all rode a bus down to the St. Louis Riverfront, where we dined on the Goldenrod Showboat. And I climbed up on the stage where so many melodramas had been performed, like my favorite one, Showboat, and I gave a speech on leadership. And I invited these women not only to go home and defeat ERA, but also to become leaders in the conservative cause, and they did. All our women were volunteers. We had no staff at that time. We recognized the worthy achievers with an Eagle Award, and we presented them with these awards as thanks for their volunteer work. The Women's Liberation Movement, which was then led by Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan, 
was at the peak of its influence, enjoying unparalleled access to the media. And Betty Friedan started the women's liberation movement with her book, The Feminine Mystique, which whined about the alleged sad fate of wives. She founded the National Organization for Women, called NOW, to urge women to be liberated from home, husband, and children. The feminist's favorite word became liberation. Uh, my book called Feminist Fantasies is a wonderful refutation of feminist nonsense about how American women are oppressed, a minority. Uh, my book ought to be used in these women's studies courses as an antidote to all those tiresome tirades by the feminists. Well, the media were solidly hostile to our cause, but we knew that the ERAers didn't have any good arguments, so we engaged them in debate whenever possible. Now, in the 1970s, Phil Donahue had the biggest audience of anyone on television. He was even bigger than Oprah. So I went on the Donahue show to expose the liberation nonsense. It's a, your daughter, then, is not going to be uh, sort of trapped in a house uh well, it, it's, the house isn't trapping. The ho do you, do, are you trying to tell me that it's liberation for a woman to go out and sit at a typewriter all day or stand in front of a factory machine all day instead of being in her own home where she can plan her own hours? You know, Phil, there's, the Army has some new ads, new billboards out around, and the big headline says, the Army has openings for cooks. And then they show a man and a woman standing in front of a big stack of potatoes in, a, in an Army kitchen. Now you're going to tell me it's liberation for a woman to leave her nice kitchen which her, with her stove and her sink and her refrigerator that her ever-loving husband bought for her and go out and cook in an army kitchen and peel potatoes under the direction of some sergeant and, and perish the thought if the sergeant is a woman. And you tell me that's liberation? Why, that isn't liberation. Liberation is in the home. Well, the feminists began to put me up against all their heavyweights. And in 1973, I did my first debate with Betty Friedan at Illinois State University. That's when Friedan famously said she'd like to burn me at the stake. <laughs> she said other things that are too indecent to tell in mixed company. Over the years, I've debated almost every prominent feminist and lectured on 500 college campuses. It has been an experience. Well, uh, Tom Snyder of The Tomorrow Show made a big effort to stage a TV debate with two couples facing off against each other. He had a terribly hard time finding any ERA advocate who had a husband. But, <laughs> but he finally found one we had never heard of, Brenda Feigen Fasto. And we had a debate on television. The Equal Rights Amendment would impose a doctrinaire equality on men and women. And that's why we think it is a fraud, because it will t actually take away from women some of the important rights they now have by law. Uh, for example, it will take away a women's right to be exempt from the draft and to be exempt from combat duty. Uh, it will take away the right of a wife to be supported by her husband in a home provided by her husband and her right to have her husband support her minor children. Take a good look at her. After the debate, she left her husband and went to live with her lesbian girlfriend. <laughs> at state legislative hearings, all during 1972, 73, 74, and 75, we presented legislators with the powerful arguments and documentation provided by the Phyllis Schlafly Report. I ultimately trekked around to testify at 41 state hearings in Little Rock, Arkansas, Richmond, Virginia, Jefferson City, Missouri, Atlanta, Georgia, Raleigh, North Carolina, Phoenix, Arizona, Columbia, South Carolina, Springfield, Illinois, Nashville, Tennessee, Tallahassee, Florida, Augusta, Maine, Montpelier, Vermont, Providence, Rhode Island, Denver, Colorado, Frankfort, Kentucky, Austin, Texas, Pierre, South Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota, Carson City, Nevada, 
Dover, Delaware, Boise, Idaho, Indianapolis, Indiana, Topeka, Kansas, Lincoln, Nebraska, Columbus, Ohio, Salt Lake City, Utah. I had to learn my state capitals. <laughs> Uh, those were experiences. Well, the draft was one of our best arguments in the early years because we were just coming out of the Vietnam War. The ERAers, most of whom were well over draft age, claimed that girls wanted to be drafted. Their leader, Betty Friedan, was emphatic about this. I have always felt, and it seems to me Americans must feel, that equality of right must mean equality of responsibility. And if there ever is a need, for a draft again, and there is no reason for women to be exempt on the basis of sex. They even got female members of Congress, such as Congresswoman Pat Schroeder, to assure us that ERA would definitely draft women into military combat. The point is that under the Equal Rights Amendment, Congress will no longer have the option. Congress will be constitutionally required to draft women on the same basis as... Do you agree with I, that, Congresswoman Schroeder? I agree that we have the power that, you know, whether or not we will continue to use it depends on the state of emergency. Do you agree that you'll have no option if the Equal Rights Amendment... That's right. We will have to put laws in that apply both to males and females equally. In other Do you want to draft side, women? That you can only uh, um, draft women for combat duty if they can perform the same functions that and men and women would have to Do you think that's desirable? Women. Yes, I think that's all right. We made so many trips to the state capitals, and I gave directions with my bullhorn. One day, a preacher rented a monkey suit and joined our demonstration walking around with a sign that read, Don't monkey with the Constitution. He almost lost his church over that. <laughs> the feminists were usually belligerent toward the legislators, whereas we were always ladies. We sent them Valentines and Easter cards and messages like this for recognizing the difference. You are terrific, fabulous, sensational, fantastic, and marvelous. Every year, our ladies baked a loaf of homemade bread and took it to every one of our 236 Illinois state legislators. The feminists called that our dirty trick. Of course, most feminists were not capable of baking the loaf of bread. <laughs> In 1976, I led a group of stop ERA women to do something none of us had ever done before. We picketed the White House to protest Betty Ford lobbying for ERA. First Lady Betty Ford has been actively campaigning for the constitutional amendment to provide equal rights for women, even to the point of telephoning state legislators. About 35 pickets showed up at the White House today to protest her activity, but Mrs. Ford told reporters she's sticking to her guns. Well, the next year I led a picket line in front of the White House to protest Rosalind Carter lobbying for ERA. But media and political pressures in favor of ERA were so powerful that hardly anybody believed ERA could be defeated. Legislators were intimidated by the constant drumbeat, the razzmatazz of celebrities such as Alan Alda and Betty Ford, by big money and by the loudmouth feminists such as Eleanor Smeal. That was intimidating to legislators. Illinois was the front line of the battle. And the ERAers had all the big political guns on their side. The governor, the Illinois Senate, and House leadership, and the media. And we desperately needed an event, something spectacular, to convince the legislators that American women really opposed ERA. I prayed we could bring a thousand people to our state capitol to rally against ERA, something that had never before happened in Springfield, Illinois. I sent out the message to all the churches, the Protestants and Evangelicals, the Catholics, the Mormons, and the Orthodox Jews. And April 27, 1976, was the day that changed the face of politics forever. 
A thousand people did come to Springfield from all over Illinois, many riding on buses that read Joy and Jesus Saves. I gave directions on my bullhorn in the rotunda. Uh, many of our people carried babies in their arms or homemade signs, and we hand-delivered our homemade bread to every legislator. That thrilling Stop ERA rally in Springfield in 1976 uh, turned the tide against ERA in Illinois. On that momentous day, we invented the pro-family movement by persuading believers of all denominations to do things most of them had never done before. They came into the political process for the first time, and they began to work together with other religious faiths for a political goal they shared namely, protection of the family and of the United States Constitution against the radical feminists. We did not have one single big political name on our, at our rally, but that rally nevertheless morphed our Stop ERA committee into the nucleus of the mighty pro-family movement that is so powerful today. Now, The pro ERAers responded with their own rally, and these are pictures taken of that pro ERA rally. Pictures that showed their ranks were filled with lesbians, abortion activists, socialist workers, party members, radicals of all kind, and other unkempt persons. <laughs> Nevertheless, most of the prominent Illinois politicians attended their rally, not ours. The ERAers displayed their radical streaks in other states, too. In Virginia, the ERAers spit on the Speaker of the House, staged a sit-down at the state capitol in Richmond, and had to be carried out by the police. ERA supporters were arrested after they protested defeat in a committee of the Virginia legislature. <laughs> Among other nasty tactics, the ERA, the ERAers hired a professional pie thrower who hit me in the face with an apple pie when I was at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City uh, receiving an award from the National Republican Club. Now, in the fall of 1977, our cause appeared hopeless, especially because the feminists were able to use government offices and taxpayers' money to promote ERA. The ERA campaign was run right out of the war room in President Carter's White House, and wavering state legislators were invited to the White House to be lobbied personally by the Carters. Bill Abzug was then a member of Congress, and she got Congress to appropriate $5 million for a tax-funded feminist convention in Houston in November 1977 called International Women's Year. It was designed to be a massive media event that would help to ratify ERA in the remaining states. The International Women's Year Convention opened in Houston. Uh, they had three first ladies on the platform, uh, Rosalind Carter, Betty Ford, and Lady Bird Johnson. That's the kind of power they were able to put out for their event. And every feminist you've ever heard of was there at that November 1977 convention in Houston. They tell me there were 3,000 members of the media on hand to give them massive press and television co coverage. But after they cheered and resolved for ERA, they locked ERA into their other demands, taxpayer funding of abortions and the entire gay rights agenda. You see, the ERAers believe that since abortion is something that happens only to women, it is sex discrimination to deny taxpayer funding for abortions. And since the word used in ERA is not women but is sex, ERA would require us to grant same-sex marriage licenses. So the famous Bella Abzug presided at that raucous convention, and you'll soon see Betty Friedan shouting from the floor. I move the adoption of the following resolution. The Equal Rights Amendment should be ratified. I would like to ask this body to give the most resounding and urgent vote for demanding the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment within the coming year. Because otherwise, the enormous expenditure of energy and money and effort that has brought us to this point will be in vain, and these 10 years of movement will be in vain. The question arises on the adoption of the resolution.
motion. All those in favor, will you please rise? Snake dance through the hall. We support the U.S. Supreme Court decisions which guarantee reproductive freedom to women. The resolution on reproductive freedom is adopted. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move the following resolution on sexual preference. Congress, state, and local legislatures should enact legislation to eliminate discrimination on the basis of sexual and affectional preference in areas including, but not limited to, employment, housing, public accommodations, credit, public facilities, government funding, and the military. They published a book setting forth their demands. But after the feminists released their balloons and pranced around with their lesbian placards, the whole country realized why they were pushing so hard for ERA and who was doing the pushing. Here are some pictures from the booths and signs at that feminist convention. And the most popular buttons worn at this feminist conference were the ones that said, a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle, and Mother Nature is a lesbian. At the booth, you could also pick up booklets on what lesbians do. A couple of months later, a reporter asked the governor of Missouri, Governor, are you for ERA? And he replied, do you mean the old ERA or the new ERA? I was for equal pay for equal work. But after those women went down to Houston and got tangled up with the abortionists and the lesbians, I can tell you ERA will never pass in the show me state. Houston gave us the proof that ERA's real agenda is taxpayer-funded abortions and gay rights. And since that feminist convention, ERA has been voted on about 25 times in state legislatures, in Congress, and in several statewide referenda, and it has never had another victory. <laughs> Nevertheless, the fight went on. To counteract that tax-funded atrocity, our Eagle Forum Board took another call in Houston at the same time, the Astro Arena. And we urged our people to come from all over the country at their own expense, of course. We called it the pro-family rally. And looking back, I don't know how we had the nerve to make a contract for a hall that seated 15,000 people. We just knew we had to make a statement. From all over the country, uh, our women rode on buses up to 20 hours each way. They came to our pro-family rally and then returned home on the buses without ever going to bed. The buses came and they came and they came. And we filled the Astro Arena to overflowing. November 19, 1977 was the day the expression pro-family movement went into the political vocabulary. The Houston Post reported an attendance of 20,000 people in a hall that could seat only 15,000. Bob Dornan was the only national celebrity who dared to come to our rally. In order to have held the line for the last five years against the tremendous odds of White House lobbying, federal government expenditure, prominent people, and big money, we had to have somebody on our side who was more powerful than the President of the United States.
When ERA was voted out of Congress in 1972, it was given a specific deadline of seven years. When the ERAers realized they were running out of time, President Carter and Congress gave them a crooked three-year time extension. The political cartoonists had a field day describing the extension as giving three more innings to a baseball game that was not tied up. Now, we, cons we considered the original seven-year deadline the constitutional termination of ERA, and so in 1979, we loudly proclaimed that we had won, that ERA was legally dead. What's the problem with the ERA, Mrs. Schlafly, in your view? What bothers you most about the possibility of its passage? The Equal Rights Amendment is a big takeaway of women's rights. When the seven-year deadline given to ERA passed on March 22nd without ratification, this was the greatest victory for women's rights since the Women's Suffrage Amendment of the 1920s, because this means that we will be able to defend you and your daughters from being drafted and sent into combat. Uh, we had a magnificent burial party at the Shoreham Hotel in Washington, D.C. on March 22, 1979. Uh, we, to celebrate, we named the title of our gala The End of ERA, and that was a double play on words because it was also the end of an era, the era of conservative defeats. When we proclaimed we had actually won, that we had beaten ERA, we gave life to the conservative movement and taught conservatives the lesson that it is really possible to win political battles. And the key to winning was to combine the fiscal conservatives with the new social conservatives, the people who cared about pro-life and about ERA, who we brought out of the churches. And then a year later in 1980, this new conservative pro-family coalition won a tremendous victory by electing Ronald Reagan, our president. But the fight went on in the three extended years, and the ERAers staged huge media events with celebrities such as Phil Donahue, Marlo Thomas, and Alan Alda, who came personally to Springfield, Illinois. For the past five years, the fight over the Equal Rights Amendment has been increasing in pitch and has become one of the volatile issues in America today. How long can we stand by and watch qualified people denied their fair share in the economy and in the, the political strength of the nation just because they're women? Well, during the extension period, the ERAers staged huge media events with uh, these kinds of celebrities. You saw that impressive demonstration. All our Illinois votes were cliffhangers. We won with a changing mix of conservative and liberal Republicans and Democrats, uh, downstate rural guys, and Chicago machine Democrats. The most dramatic Illinois vote came on June 18, 1980. Tension was very high, and all the national media showed up with their cameras. President Jimmy Carter was telephoning Democratic legislators and promising them federal housing projects in their districts if they would vote yes on ERA. Republican Governor James Thompson was telephoning Republican legislators and promising dams, roads, and bridges in their districts if they would vote yes. Mayor Jane Byrne was telephoning Chicago legislators and forcing them to vote yes under threat of firing them and their relatives from city patronage jobs. Democratic legislators who were beholden to the Chicago machine wept publicly as they apologized to me for having to vote yes so their relatives wouldn't lose their jobs. And then there were even cash bribes flowing. One feminist was finally later convicted of offering a cash bribe to one of the legislators for a yes vote. It was exciting on that day when the votes climbed electronically on the panel in the House chamber. A great shout went up when it became clear that we had defeated ERA again. I was standing in the gallery of the Illinois House when ABC Nightline put now President Eleanor Smeal in front of the cameras and said, Miss Smeal, you said you had the votes. What happened? 
And she replied, there is something very powerful against us, and I certainly don't mean people. Smeal didn't know what that power was, but we knew it was prayer and the truth. We had done all we could, and... <laughs> but the punchline is, we had done all we could, and the Lord brought us two votes from Chicago legislators who had never voted our way before. One of the biggest battles uh, in our ERA fight was the Republican National Convention in Detroit in 1980. ERA had been in the Republican platform for many years, and I was determined to take it out so that Ronald Reagan would not be embarrassed by the feminists. But that wasn't easy. The uh, ERAers were organized and noisy. They had all the media and most important Republican officials on their side. Their spokesman was Congresswoman Margaret Heckler. So the Equal Rights Amendment, about 5,000 of them, marched outside the convention hall, threatening to paint lines of discord across the picture of harmony the Reagan forces want to portray here. ERA supporters have not given up. In fact, they're working on a new strategy to add ERA to the party's platform, a strategy that calls for lining up six states with majority support for ERA. Just judging from the enormous outpouring of, of in amazement and shock and dismay across America over the Republican Party's refusal to affirm the ERA, I would say that millions of votes are at stake on this issue. Well, indeed, millions of votes were at stake, and they voted for Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan assured me that he was against ERA. Well, on January 3, 1982, Oklahoma defeated ERA for the last time. On June 4, North Carolina defeated ERA for the last time. And the disgruntled pro-ERAers then sent disgusting bags of chicken manure to the 23 senators who voted no. Time was running out for ERA, but the ERAers never ran out of money. In the last weeks, they spent $15 million on a TV advertising campaign featuring Hollywood celebrities such as Ed Asner and Archie Bunker. Now, since they didn't have a single good argument for ERA, you can see how stupid their ad was. Help pass ERA. 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 Well, you can see they had no arguments. And, and, <laughs> And, 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 of course, that was one of the things about ERA. They never could show any benefit to women whatsoever. And fortunately, that $15 million ad did not persuade any legislators to vote yes. On uh, June 21st, Florida defeated ERA for the last time. I'm, I'm sure there's some here who helped in that battle. Uh, Illinois, for the, Illinois was forced to vote on ERA every year for 10 years. And last year, things got very ugly as the battle continued. In April, the excommunicated Mormon, Sonia Johnson, started a hunger strike in the Capitol. And she was joined by Dick Gregory and other experienced hunger strikers, making it a big media event. And then, a chain gang of pro-ERAers chained themselves to the door of the Senate chamber. There they are, the chain gang. ERA lobbyists have tried to embarrass the Illinois legislature into a favorable vote. Seven women are into their third week of a hunger strike, and 14 others have chained themselves to the entrance of the state Senate since last Thursday. In the 59-year history of the Equal Rights Amendment, we've never been so close. I can't wait. And I want to be there when the dream of equality becomes a reality. 
Well, ERA supporters then went to the slaughterhouse and bought plastic bags of pig's blood and came back and wrote on our marble floors of the state capitol the names of the legislators they hated the most. Fortunately, those tactics did not persuade our legislators to vote yes, and Illinois finally dealt the death blow to ERA. Within a year, 30 states had ratified the amendment. It seemed nothing could stop it. But Phyllis Schlafly changed the course of ERA. And it would be a direct attack on our families, on our morals, on our culture. She created and led the Stop ERA movement. As soon as the state legislature started to have hearings and we began to have equal time, it was obvious that the people didn't want it and that it could be defeated. From her home, she mobilized 50,000 housewives into a conservative strike force. Her women delivered flowers to legislators and closely monitored voting records on ERA. So on June 30th, 1982, 1,500 battle-weary but triumphant Stop ERA volunteers gathered again in the ballroom of the Shoreham Hotel in Washington to celebrate our second and final burial of ERA at midnight. A giant rainbow of balloons rose high over the dais, and then many political personages, including President Reagan, paid tribute. The heroes of the day were the women who came from the 15 states that never ratified ERA, plus the five states that bravely rescinded their previous ratifications. We have them out there. They have stood the test. And we can build this into a mighty movement that can set America on the right path. We need your help in this effort. Then conquer we must, for our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. We have the people with the strength of character, and this battle we have waged has proved it. Thank you for being here. The evening closed with singing the impossible dream. We had truly won an impossible battle and defeated the unbeatable foe. Thank you for coming.